be able to share the information with other people who couldn't, who couldn't be here. So, no faces, we promise. <laughs> well, um, as I said, we are so happy you are here this morning, and this is the third year um, our church has done this, and every year it gets bigger and better, and a lot of great information is shared, and I think it's a great way to spend a Saturday morning, so thank you for being here. Um, we are very honored to have a group of really top-notch mental health professionals here with us today to answer questions. And I don't know about you, but I love information. I think that really helps clarify things when you can ask an expert something and, and maybe have an answer to a question you might have. So before we get started, I did want to go ahead and, and let the panel introduce themselves. Um, we have, you know, as I said, three wonderful women here. We'll start at the end with um, Stacey Lanier. I'm going to ask you all just to go through the panel and introduce yourself um, and then maybe talk about your area of expertise and sort of you know, where you sort of focus maybe your practice. So Stacy, go ahead. I'm Stacey Lanier. Um, I am currently in private practice in Fulcher, Texas. I don't know if anybody knows where Fulcher is. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Most people are like, where is that? Um, I started my career actually working with Jill at the Houston VA and I worked with combat veterans. and so. I've been trained in PTSD and anxiety. That's my focus. Now I see people just like us in private practice who are kind of going through difficult life experiences. Um, so that's pretty much where I am today. I, I do a lot of work with mindfulness, um, and I'll talk probably some about meditation and um, keeping our hearts and minds in the present moment. But that's that's where I do most of my work now. Ashley? Good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Chattery. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I've been counseling for the past eight years, and I've worked in a variety of settings. Currently, I'm working at the Harris Center. It's an outpatient mental health clinic, and I'm doing diagnostic assessments for people who believe they have mental health concerns, and so I really enjoy doing that. I've done EAP work before, and I've also um, work with faith and mental health and how that intersects with the Hope and Healing Center with Marissa. And um, that's, I was really, really passionate about that work that we did, and I think that's really my specialty, is just helping people understand how to integrate their faith and their mental health and how they all work together, and so that's what I really enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Emma? Um, my name is Emma Taylor, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have worked in um, acute mental health crisis and hospital settings. Um, Right now I work with kids with chronic illnesses and their mental health and just kind of learning to accept their illness. And then I'm also a professor at the Baylor School of Social Work for Masters of Social Work students. So as you can see, we have a broad range of expertise, so this is going to be an exciting discussion. So we live in a society that really spends a whole lot of time um, talking about good health. I mean, wellness is really a buzzword. We hear it all the time. I mean, we think about what we eat. We talk about getting enough sleep, we talk about exercise, we talk about what kind of vitamins to have, what kind of water to drink. I mean, all of these sorts of things. I mean, it's constantly, I don't think we can go a day without this idea of, boy, what does it mean to be healthy and what can I do to try to improve my health? But while we really talk a whole lot about striving for better health, we really don't talk so much about our mental health. We really tend to talk so much about our physical health. And why is that? Well, you know, it's really a big problem because in a recent study with the World Health Organization, um, it estimate, they estimated that one in four of us will be affected by a mental health or neurological disorder at some point in our lives. And that's one in four. So it's a very big topic, but not one we spend a whole lot of time on. Why is that? Why is there a stigma um, sort of associated with talking about mental health. I mean, a lot of times they think it's maybe access to care, or the cost, or um, maybe embarrassment, or maybe not an inability to really um, sort of assess our own situation. I mean, maybe somebody on the outside can see, or maybe we can see someone, somebody we're close to, potentially needs help, and, and we just wonder, you know, what do we do? How do we access the system? You know, what's the first step? So that's what we're really trying to do today, is to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about this and put mental health at the same level as we, we talk about other aspects of our health. So that's what I'm hoping we'll do today, is have a real fruitful discussion and have the opportunity to ask some questions we might have. And uh, I know 
I love to get answers to questions I have. What is it? So um, we, we've got a, uh, we've passed out some little cards, and Ken's going to pass the basket around in case you have, you know, in case you um, have a question. But to get things started, um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to pose a question, and we'll go through the panel and, and get all of the panel's response to it. So as we talk about mental health, what would a mental health checkup look like? And Stacey, I'm going to start. With you. Um, I actually love that you started with the physical things because when I work with clients, I'm very much focused on the biopsychosocial model and spirituality. I really love that you mentioned that too. So when I'm kind of doing a mental health checkup with someone or even looking at myself, I want people to talk about what their physical health is like, what, what vitamins, supplements are they taking, what exercise routine do they have, what sleep routine do they have. But then also, where is their mind and where is their heart? And I mentioned that earlier. Um, I think that it's very important to ask yourself whether or not, well, to ask yourself where are your thoughts on a daily basis? Are you focused on positive things? Are you focused on negative things? Um, are you looking at the present moment? Are you looking at the past? Are you looking at the future? So trying to assess kind of where you are and um, what you want your focus to be. And I very much believe that we need to be in the present moment. The past is important, and we talk, I mean, I work with clients about things that have happened quite a bit, and having goals for the future. But I think that our society is so fast-paced that we are not in the present moment, and we're not focused on who we are now and where God is in our lives now, and the relationships that we have. So those are some of the things that I really want to talk to my clients about. You know, I heard one time, and I've always kept it, because I think staying in the present is hard for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I heard one time it said, if you live in the past, you'll be depressed. If you live in the future, you'll be anxious, because we worry. You have to live in the present is really our goal, is to just stay right here, not try and revert to the past, and not try to look too much for the future. So I think you bring up such an excellent point. Ashley, do you have a thought on that, the, what, what a mental health checkup would look like? Sure. Um, I think what, going back to what you were saying, that self-awareness, you know, knowing yourself, knowing if your mood changes, knowing if your behavior changes, if your relationship starts to change, I think always checking in with yourself, how am I doing today, or how, how have I been doing for the past month, and just constantly having that self-evaluation, that, that mindset um, on a consistent basis. And also realizing that mental health exists on a continuum. And, you know, no one in here has perfect mental health, right? Um, we used to say, um, no one has perfect mental health but Jesus, right? So we all fall somewhere on that continuum. And so just kind of, uh, like, whether it's more on the severe mental um, like illness side or if it's just kind of like I'm functioning, but I'm not functioning at, at the level that I want to be functioning, you know, we're all somewhere on that line. And so just recognizing when, when you're starting to move a little further down the um, continuum and when you're getting better, just again, having that self-awareness is really, really important. So that's what I would say about that. I think you're right too about the fluctuation. I mean, I think we all wake up every day feeling, you know, maybe physically different. Some days we're more tired, some days we feel like we have more energy, and I do think we, we have to see that our mental health, and I guess it's when, when you have a long span of maybe sadness or a long, you know, I'm sure that that's probably a good gauge that maybe it might be time to look outside yourself and maybe see if there's a deeper, more deep lying problem. Emma, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think just to echo what um, Stacey and Ashley have said, I think that when you, we know that our thoughts connect our feelings, connect our behaviors. So when you notice patterns of thoughts that you're not enjoying or that are not helpful to you or kind of feelings or behaviors that you feel like aren't true to who you are or who you want to be. I think those are all good check-in points to notice, okay, there's this new pattern and it's creating more havoc in my thoughts and feelings. Or I notice that I'm snapping at my kids a lot more and so I kind of wonder what's behind that um, in my brain and in my heart. Um, and then I also would speak to the importance of community, that you have some people who are close to you who maybe can see changes in your mood or changes in your sleep or your appetite and things like that in ways that maybe when we get so stressed or overwhelmed and busy, we don't notice that we've started to drift from you know what looks like our healthiest selves. And so having some people, whether it's a spouse or a close friend or a pastor who can speak to you 
and kind of speak into that. And you know, I think it it requires that we're open and honest and vulnerable in that way. Um, but we should have some people around us who can also kind of speak to what's going on. With us. I think those are all excellent points. And Kevin's uh, picking up some cards here for me. And and you know, we have plenty of paper. And if you ask a question and you want to ask another one, we certainly you know that this is a fluid conversation and. So I think I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the cards, and then we'll just sort of, and I think the best way to do this is to allow, you know, we'll just sort of hop in organically, like, you know, and if you have something, you know, we don't have to go through, because not everybody <coughs> might have, the, have a comment on it. So here's a question. Um, what are some pointers on things we can incorporate into our daily life to check in with our mental health? Anybody? Is that a good one? So um, who would like to start us? Okay. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, first having kind of an idea of what looks like health to you, so a day that you feel well, and then um, kind of creating a scale for yourself. So if you had a really good day where you were feeling happy, you're feeling engaged with your family, um, being able to check in with yourself and say, okay, if that's a five for me, then is today, you know, a one, two, three, four, where am I kind of falling in there? Um, and then noticing those patterns. So kind of like was said earlier, if you're noticing a pattern of, you know, maybe two weeks of um, not having five days, maybe having one or two days, then that's a good way to check in with yourself and know, oh, okay, okay I need to be paying more attention to this. And then also, like I was saying earlier, noticing changes in your sleep, appetite, the way that you're engaging with your family, things like that are good ways to just kind of check in. And I think just having a pause and having a moment where you're actually checking in with yourself is really the first step in all of that, that you're getting a couple minutes to yourself every day where you're stopping and checking in with you, checking in with your thoughts, your heart, your feelings, and then you can move forward from there. I think you bring up such a good point, Emma, because I think as women, we have, we have so many buckets in our life that need our attention. And I know I've truly fallen into that place where you just are doing everything for everyone else and you all of a sudden just feel like you're kind of a robot, right? And I think you're so smart and that's so true about just stopping and realizing it's okay. It's okay to take 30 <laughs> minutes and go have a cup of coffee and read a magazine. You know, give yourself that opportunity. I mean, we feel like, oh my gosh, I should be folding laundry now or, you know, I should. And, and it's really okay because it's so important to take those pauses. Did you um, add that? Yes, I do. I'm going to echo both what Ashley and Emma have said and, and what you were just saying about the self-awareness and taking time for yourself. Um, I have found in my life, both personally and professionally, with myself and with my clients, that taking care of ourselves is our number one priority because we cannot do everything that we need to do for our families, for our churches, for our communities, for our jobs, if we are not taking care of ourselves. And part of that is the self-awareness, and I, I just kind of wanted to share something that I um, have incorporated into my life over the last few years and really emphasize with my clients is quiet time in the morning, and not just Bible study and prayer, which is important, but literally being quiet with God, um, whether that's meditation, um, there's something called centering prayer that is focused on repeating a, a sacred sentence or sacred words but it's listening to God. It is um, <clears throat> just being quiet. It's being still. And I have found that that is imperative for us to be able to be present, like I was talking about being here and now, and being able to be self-aware and hear what God's telling us that we need to be focusing on with ourselves and with other people. I think you're so right. I, I try to do quiet time in the morning, and when I don't do it, I really notice a difference. I really do. Mm -hmm. And I keep, then I make myself mad that I don't, Fit it in, make sure it happens every morning because you I know. That. Keep yourself up about it. I know, but it is. It's sort of like, no, you just need to do it because you know it's going to truly make a difference. 10, 15 minutes. So, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Did anybody else have anything else they wanted to add to that? We're good. Okay, let's move on and see. Um, during uh, or taking exams during college, what are some t techniques? to do to lower stress and anxiety. And boy, is that Nancy, true. Nancy, could you speak up? Certainly. Oh, I have a loud voice. I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hear the loud voice. So if you're a student, or if you maybe have a student in your household, what are some things that we can do, um, techniques, to help reduce that stress? Because boy, taking exams is a stressful time. Anybody have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I think it starts with thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, just kind of like, um, um, with anxiety, like a lot, it's, it's, it's thought driven and it's also the physical symptoms of anxiety too. So knowing, um, noticing the thoughts that you're thinking prior to taking the test, like are you already thinking, oh, I'm not going to do good, I'm going to fail, this is so hard. Like if you're constantly repeating that negative self-talk, that's going to feed into and grow that anxiety and then you're going to start feeling like your heart's going to start racing, your palms are going to start sweating, you know, you're going to start shaking because you're <coughs> telling yourself all these things and then your body is responding, so it's going to be, you know, like, really, really stressful. So I think um, just positive self-talk, and you know, going going into it with a positive perspective, of course, preparation um, for the exam is key, you know, you have to do the work so that you can know that you can um, actually succeed when you do take the exam. But just, you know, talking to yourself in a more helpful and healthy way, um, learning how to control your bodily sensations, whether it's deep breathing, meditation, yoga, anything that can help you be able to um, manage those physical symptoms of anxiety is important too. So I'll just add that. So anybody else have anything to add? Yeah, I think to echo what Ashley said, I talk to my kids a lot. I work with kids primarily ages 9 to 18, so they're in school, they're taking tests, they're anxious most of the time. Um, so I talk to them a lot about, similarly, you know, choosing helpful thoughts. And so I try to focus less of them on positive thoughts and negative thoughts, but just what's helpful to me in this moment. Is it helpful for me to think that um, I'm going to fail this test and my mom's going to ground me? It's not really helpful to think about that right now. What helps you get to where you want to be? So it's helpful for me to think I'm going to do my best on this test. And so then trying to help them connect. When I change that thought, what do I notice is different about my body, about my... Um, breathing, about my behaviors, things like that. And then I would also say, you know, kind of to Stacy's mindfulness piece, trying to stay grounded and present in the moment. And so something I teach my kids to do is to um, touch their toes and then touch the floor and then touch their toes and touch the floor so that you're reconnecting to your body, reconnecting to where your body is. And so you're not getting caught up in future thoughts about if I fail this test, then I'm never going to go to college and then I'm going to live on the streets or whatever it is, uh, but reconnecting to I'm in my body and my body is in this classroom and that's all I have control of. <coughs> so touching your feet, touching the floor. When I got engaged, I, <laughs> as my husband was proposing, I bent down and touched my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that video, it's great. Uh, I just go down and then I go back up. So, <laughs> but I think grounding and trying to keep yourself present in the moment um, is really helpful. Love that grounding technique. That's a really great idea. Such a great uh, One of the things that I thought about is um, Brene Brown talks about square breathing. I don't know if y'all mm -hmm. use the square breathing. Um, I I love breath work and I work with my clients on that, but I think square breathing is really an easy thing to to implement. And it is where you breathe in for four counts, you hold for four counts, you exhale for four counts, and then you hold again for four counts before you take another breath. And the, count, the length of the counts depends on each individual person and the way that your breath works. But um, I think that doing that kind of breath work combined with the grounding exercises and the thoughts mm -hmm. could You got it, right? You're helpful, helpful, on the right? Question, right? right? Isn't it, would it be helpful if we just practice that so we remember it? <laughs> sure, let's do it. Let's try it. Sure. Um, I take long breaths. So <laughs> breathe in for four counts. One, two, three. Four, hold, one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, and inhale. So again, you have to kind of judge how long your breath counts are. But if you do, I mean, even if you do that three or four times, you will find that the physiological symptoms that you experience with anxiety will ease. I think Brittany Brown actually talked about that she learned that from um, special forces, that they use that technique, like snipers, before they have to engage in battle. I think that's I think I've heard that too. I think I even saw that in a movie one time. Don't you remember? Something like, yeah, that there's a, because you've got a center and be as calm as you can possibly be. And if you're, if you're doing that kind of breath work, you can't be anywhere but the present. So. We talked this word anxiety, you know, has popped up, and I do think we, if you read anything about, you know, mental health, the current mental health state of our country, or 
trends or youth or that anxiety levels are high. I mean, that is just the buzzword. I mean, I do have to say in everything I read leading up to this, when you look at women, depression is really the, the most common probably mental health concern. But I think a lot of times depression and, and anxiety go hand in hand. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, maybe separating the two and understanding why we are so darn anxious and why anxiety, I mean, it's really prevalent in, like, the millennials. I mean, you just hear it all the time. I mean, that, and college-age kids, they're so anxious, they're so anxious. Um, anybody want to address that? Well, I can address it from a personal standpoint because I struggle with both. Um, I think what I've been learning is that my, my anxiety comes from a need to control, and then when I can't control, I get depressed. Because I get sad that I can't control it. So it's like they kind of go back and forth. And so what I'm learning in just my personal life is just that um, that need to like surrender. You know, surrender the need to control and rest that God has it under control. You know, so surrender and rest has been kind of going hand in hand for me to battle that depression and anxiety. Because they can be really debilitating. Very much so. You know, I think that's an excellent point where does that depression come and, and I understand that control piece mm -hmm. and and how we just we just have to be and, so, and sometimes we just have to give ourselves a break we just yeah. have to give ourselves a break right mm -hmm. we just can't do it all sometimes anybody else have any impact? I love what you just said about surrender and rest mm -hmm. and that is so countercultural. and what I just want to kind of camp on is we have to be very intentional about shifting our mindset from the drive-through, get your stuff done, go, 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 fold the laundry, to I need to surrender and rest. That God calls us to do that. I mean, that's <clears throat> biblical. And but that's not what our what our world tells us. So I think being intentional about where our thoughts are going, and Ashley talked about thoughts and Emma too, that we have to just be aware and we have to control what we're thinking and let it be okay that we're going to surrender and rest if it's reading a magazine, if it's 30 minutes of quiet time, if it's reading a book, whatever it is. It's okay. We need that. Join us. Come on in. Plenty of seats. Welcome. I don't have a question. Yeah. I was just going to tie on to pitch on to your thing about culturally. Uh, I don't remember how the expression you said, but social media and having a phone and other things that are hurry up and answer that text and hurry up and answer that email and hurry up and do that adds anxiety to your life and I experienced a real change at Christmas because I dropped my phone on Christmas Day in water and for two and a half days because I wasn't happy with the next phone I got so I, anyway I just go around and say this is the wonderful world <laughs> <laughs> this is just calm and I don't have to look on the seat and look at the car the phone and I don't have to we lost this. And who says that we have to respond text mess to text messages immediately? All of my friends and my clients know I, I put my phone down when I go in my house. I might look at it every couple of hours. And even if I'm looking at it more often, I, I'm not gonna respond. And people know that I've set the expectation that people know that about me. And some people get frustrated and not my problem. <laughs> my problem. But but we have to ask ourselves where where did that rule come in? And we also we have studies currently that show that people who are involved in social media like Facebook, Instagram, and are spending a lot of time there are more depressed than people who are not because we are comparing. People put their best foot forward on Facebook and the best filter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. I don't even know how to do all those like, photograph things. But I I, I have Facebook. I look at Facebook maybe once a week, and then I set a timer, and I'll do it for five minutes, and that's it. That's, that's a very good idea to set a timer because it is a time suck. Isn't yes, because you start looking, and then you look at the comments, and then you you know, <laughs> crazy, crazy. But you're right. When, when did it? When did? Where's the rule book that said, yeah, as soon as you get a text, the timer's on, and you're supposed to respond right now? We, and, and I also think that that's a reminder that we set our own rules. We don't have to go with the rules that society is putting out there. That's something that we do without awareness. So when you're aware, thinking, being aware of your thoughts, 
you don't have to go with that if you don't want to. If it's helpful, then sure. If it's not helpful, I love that too. You can use that too. <laughs> You know, one of, in the brochure and sort of in the lead up to this conference, one of the questions, and I do want to address it even though it's a very basic one, is when do you know that it's time that you or possibly a friend or loved one needs to seek professional help? When are we beyond the, you know, we all can have blue days. And we can all have times where we're like, oh, just, but when do you know that, wow, I really might need a little bit more extra help getting through this stage in my life or, or helping a loved one get through the stage. <coughs> Emma, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, I think it's a good practice for everyone to see a therapist. And I think what I've learned in being a therapist is that you can't be a therapist if you don't have a good therapist. Um, so I think that part of it is just being able to talk about it and reduce that stigma and say, I've noticed such an interesting shift in my friendships when I'm able to talk about when I was in therapy the other day and then people are more likely to say, hey, can you tell me who that person was? I've actually been thinking about it. And so I think kind of the first jumping off point is just being able to talk about and reducing the stigma around going. But I think, like we talked about earlier, when you're noticing a new pattern of thoughts, feelings, or behaviors that you don't think are helpful to you, and then also in significant life changes. And so that doesn't just have to be, you know, a child moving out of the house or, you know, a, the death of a loved one, but even just age-related life changes. You know, there's a developmental shift for um, adults from, you know, 20s to 30s and then 30s to 50s when kids move out of the house and then caring for older parents or becoming an older parent, things like that. And so I think um, having someone to kind of help you in those transitions as life starts to look different um, and you can also do that proactively, is decide, you know, there is this change coming up, let me go ahead and um, engage this help before, you know, it gets to a place where I'm desperate for it. And so I think it can be a proactive thing and it also can be a reactive thing. Yes, um, I definitely agree with what you were saying about, <coughs> you know, being open and, and like about going to therapy, the need to have a therapist, even therapists have a mm -hmm. therapist, you know, I think that's really, really important. Um, and yeah, um, just being more vulnerable about talking about what's, like, uh, what you've been experiencing, that's something I've been trying to do more, because I'm, I, I had always been more of a private person, and so people never really knew I had struggles, and so me opening up about my struggles has encouraged other people to open up, because they're like, oh, she's not okay? It's okay for me not to be okay until so it kind of opened that door. But I had to kind of take that first step, especially in my closest relationships. And I thought, and I saw how it brought us um, more, it brought us closer together. So that was a real blessing to see that. Um, I would also say just kind of noticing if um, you're like if if you're not able to function as well at work, at school, at home. Like if if you notice. Know Noticing those changes in functioning, um, noticing changes in sleep, not being able to sleep, sleeping too much, changes in appetite. Um, if if people start like adopting unhealthy coping mechanisms, where it's turning to an addiction, and shopping can be an addiction too. <laughs> Facebook, so can, be an Facebook addiction. can be an addiction. You know, there you can be addicted to anything these days. So just noticing um, those those like extreme um, behaviors changes, mood changes, and I, mean, I think they both, <coughs> yeah. both covered it, but I, I always talk to people about, like Ashley was talking about the continuum of mental health with functioning on one end, are you functioning, just like she said, but then also what's your quality of life, and echoing Emma, I, I, I want people to come in and see me when they're doing okay and they just want to get better. I, I interviewed a couple um, on Thursday, and they're like, We've mentioned the D word, but we really just want our marriage to be stronger. And I'm like, yes, that's when you need to be coming in before you're in crisis. Mm -hmm. We can handle crisis too. I mean, that's fine, but the proactive and being aware of where you are on that continuum of functioning and quality of life. And you may be functioning fine, but if your quality of life isn't where you want it to be, go see somebody. Well, I would even say to Stacy's point, it can, if right now you feel like, I don't need to see a therapist, it may be a great time to go establish a relationship with one yes. so that in the future mm -hmm. you you have a person you can call if things get harder. And so just already knowing I have this person and as needed, that person is there for me as a lifeline. And I had read this, um, this article like a while back that was about like smiling depression 
you know, that the kind of like the like hidden face of depression, you know, like you look really good on you really you look really good on the outside and maybe you are functioning well. Maybe you're functioning too well, you know, trying trying to cover up, you know, your your like true feelings and like I think that's huge. Like I actually know quite a few people who I know deep down that they're struggling with depression, but everybody else to the outside world, well, they, they look Right, they look normal, their lives look, you know, how they're supposed to look. And so I think, um, again, that takes being vulnerable and being willing to take off that mask, to not feel like you have to wear a mask, not feel like you have to pretend that everything is okay and admit, okay, something, something's not right with me, you know, and sharing that with someone. Well, I, I totally agree. I went through a period of time a few years ago and I sought some professional help and it was the best thing I ever did for myself. I mean, I really, I, I and I was amazed at, at the ideas and the skills and the tools that the therapist was able to give me to address some of these issues that were going on. And I thought, wow, I, this was the best thing I ever did for myself. And I agree, uh, you know, periodic check-in is a really great thing when there's a transition in your life. And it's just amazing how someone who is not right in your family or right really close to you but is sort of that dispassionate third party that is able to look at something and go, have you ever thought about that? That that's the core? And you're like, there it is, the elephant in the room. And you just couldn't see it. So I definitely agree that um, it's, it's an on, can be an ongoing relationship that can uh, just bring a lot of uh, improvement and happiness to your life and help you get through some difficult things. And I think the other thing you brought up that is a good point was the fact that I mean, if we're in crisis and we're in the ICU, then that that's too bad. You know, we, we should have gone to the doctor a lot sooner before we had, you know, pneumonia and we're in the ICU, opposed to when we were just not feeling well. And, and so your mental health has to be addressed and cared for just like we would care for our physical health. Yes. Hi, this is a good segue to, because I'm here, I'm a pharmacist and I'm here as a professional. I had a couple questions for, for you guys. And you probably couldn't read my writing anymore because it's all, <laughs> it was too long. So it's two parts. So what I see in, in my practice is that, of course, not just therapy, but once a prescription is written and you have someone where depression has been identified and they get a prescription and they come to the pharmacy to fill it. And we, you know, we talk to them about how you have to take it before you notice and that kind of thing. And then we have something that we have now that we follow up to make sure that they're compliant. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talk, my question to you guys is that we, what should we counsel on? Because what we find is that even though some of these uh, patients are going to therapy and they're not, uh, most of the patients are not only taking whatever type of medicines are prescribed, but they're also having, you know, chronic illnesses, some other things that, that have contributed to it. They, they don't understand or they feel that, okay, now that I feel better, I don't think I need it anymore, and then they stop taking it, and then they think they can just start taking it when they don't when they're depressed again. So how do we get oh, get over to them, get conveyed to them that it is a continuum, and you it goes normally, uh, hopefully, medication goes hand in hand with therapy and that type of thing, and other life changes, and that that's a decision that you and your um, healthcare professionals should make together. You know, and if you're having side effects or whatever, you should communicate with that with them. Because quite honestly, what they'll, a lot of the patients will do is that they'll feel it, and when you call them, well, I didn't, I'm not taking it, I don't like the way <coughs> you feel, blah, 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 blah. So how do we get across to them the importance of taking the medication as prescribed, and if you're having issues with it, to convey that to your health care provider? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it can be helpful to kind of explain the biological process that it takes, you know, six to eight weeks for us to even know if it works and for your body to get used to it. And then I think kind of explaining that the medicine isn't used as needed, but to create this new level of stability chemically. Um, because when you do have a crisis, you don't want to wait six to eight weeks for help. So you don't want to have to restart a medication that's not going to bring you the help that you need when that comes up. But um, more so you want to equip your body to be able to handle things as life comes because we don't know what's going to happen day to day. And so I think if you can kind of explain the piece of it takes a while to start working and then um, 
you know, we need it to create this level of stability that hopefully that helps. I also talk about it kind of like an antibiotic. I mean, you take an antibiotic, you start feeling better. I mean, the, yeah, it's, what's it, it's a band -aid, exactly. What's it going to do? And the compliance is almost not even an issue at that point. And part two is that you were talking about, we, I see, we see a lot of patients that say that they're diagnosed with diabetes or some other type of chronic illness, and you see them come in month to month, and you notice a, a change in them, and their, you know, in their appearance, in their attitude, in their, what is a good way to approach a patient that are, are they lost a loved one, because we have a lot of elderly people, to tell them as a health professional, you know, I noticed a little bit, you know, changes in, and are you doing okay? Have you thought about possibly talking to a therapist? How are things going? What, because you kind of like don't want to, you know, we all have bad days, you know, and sometimes you just, it's just that we, we talk about, like you said, the medicine, but how do you approach someone like, you know, have you ever thought about seeing a therapist? You seem to be a little down in that type of thing. What You're reading my notes. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very important question. Yeah. What if it's somebody else in your life and you think, wow, they really need some help? How do you broach that subject with someone else? Trick, it's tricky. Well, I think you framed it really well that you're coming from a loving, compassionate place and you are coming from a place of relationship, even though you know, you are the pharmacist, you're still probably seeing them at least once a month, if not more often. And so I think um, really trying to approach it in a way that says I want to come alongside you, not I want you to stay away from me. And so I think rather than just saying, hey, I think you need to see a therapist, but saying, how are you doing since this happened? What's been different for you? How are you feeling today? And kind of engaging in that conversation helps <clears throat> open that channel of communication so it doesn't feel like judgment, it doesn't feel like stigma. Um, but it instead says, hey, I care about you and I want to walk with you through this. How can I do that? And I think like Ashley was saying, if, if you have worked with somebody, if you can be vulnerable enough to say, I've talked to somebody and it helped me. That's very much, I think, coming alongside somebody versus, we've got a problem. Here's a, here's a card. Right? <laughs> but it requires us to be vulnerable. And I, I'm just, I love that you said that, actually, because I think that's very hard. Do you find that those assessments, you know, that you'll go to the doctor or maybe for your checkup and they'll, I mean, because some people need more of a, you know, sort of an empirical data point, right? Um, and they answer questions and all of a sudden, well, I never thought, no, I really am not sleeping through the night. Oh, do I cry often? Well, yeah, I do cry often. You know, I mean, things like that. Do you find that sometimes those assessments can make somebody take a look at it and go, well, there it is in black and white. I think I really do need to seek some professional help. Yeah, I've had, um, like doing the assessments that I'm doing now, like I've had like a lot of clients that have been referred from by their primary care doctor, or or like their primary care doctor had been prescribing them a, 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 like, antidepressants and was like, okay, you need to go <coughs> see a psychiatrist. And so they, I have been seeing them making that bridge to actually go see them. Um, I saw some writing. Does anybody else have other cards that, that you've written? Does anybody raise your hand? Anybody have one? Okay. I just want to make sure we've got every every card picked up. Um, does anybody have any questions that they don't want to write it on a card? <laughs> there we go. I know a person that has been struggling with their appetites. Like, they're not eating or they don't want to eat. And they've been struggling with it for years. And right now it's coming again. And I wanted to know some ways that I can help the person. My first question, or my first thought was, are, are we talking about an eating disorder? Are we talking about depression? About are eating, we talking about anxiety? I don't anxiety? know. I feel like this person has depression and an eating disorder that he did have before. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know, how can I help him? <laughs> well, I think kind of like we talked about before, I think coming from that point of, I care about you, I notice these changes, mm -hmm. and can I help? through the, or help you with this, and like, can I help get you to the person who can actually provide that help and care? Because I think that's another thing that we have to kind of tread lightly on, is not becoming that person's unofficial therapist or official therapist, if you're us, <laughs> um, but trying to be a bridge to help 
um, in a way that says, you know, I, I see you and I want this for you, but I can't be the answer for you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, noticing those patterns in your friend, but also not trying to be the one who fixes them, but rather the one who identifies them and then helps connect. And what is the best way then, if they do need, I mean, obviously we have three experts right here and wonderful services, but if someone is trying to look for a therapist, is there, is there a good way to do that and a good source? <coughs> I think psychology today is the easiest way to start. So yeah. you can put in your zip code, your insurance, if you're looking for a male or a female, if there's a certain issue that you would like help with, and um, it's, it's like a Google of therapists that narrows it down for you. Um, so particularly if you don't know other people or you haven't talked to other people who are going to therapy, um, you can't say like, hey, who's that person like? Um, I think psychology today is the easiest I agree. way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always Personal referral is by far the best mm -hmm. um, because not these two lovely women, but there can be some crazy people in mental health. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, meet them in your social work class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, when I see a new client, I always tell them, I have to feel like I can help you. You have to feel like you, I can help you. Well, this has to be a mutual agreement. Go meet with other people. If you, if there's any inkling that you do not feel comfortable with me, go meet with other therapists. Mm -hmm. Make sure that it's a good fit. Just because it looks great on Psychology Today or your best friend uses whatever therapist, you have to go with your intuition and with your heart. And if it does not feel right, keep looking. I think that's such a good point because we had have a good fit, but I've had friends who've gone and said, well, that therapy doesn't work for me. I went to this one person and it didn't work. And I want to say, you know what? You need to keep looking because right. I really think that there, there's somebody out there that you'll make the connection. And it, it's like any relationship. Some, sometimes we connect and sometimes we don't. So I think that's a really good point. And it doesn't mean it's a bad therapist. It just no, means the connection right, right. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do think the sort of elephant in the room, too, is cost. Um, I mean, it's, it's always, it's a difficult you know, insurance doesn't oftentimes cover mm -hmm. mental health services, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to be a pun, but it really is, um, you know, unbelievable that, that insurance carriers don't recognize it. Tell me what you all have found and what is the best way. Um, as you said, going through psychology today, you can put in your insurance and, and, and find therapists that take insurance. Well, if some companies also offer, like, employee assistance programs that that do provide you like a certain number of free counseling sessions. So, and and uh, like a lot of employees don't know about their their like companies, uh, uh, like EAP. So I would start there and see if they have some kind of um, support there. And then um, also some therapists do offer like um, a, a, like a sliding scale. And so just kind of asking therapists um, what's their um, uh, like if they offer that. And mm -hmm. if they if they don't, maybe they can refer you to someone else who who does have like more lower cost and um, and there are some other agencies that do offer like free support groups and you know things like that too so even if you just kind of start off in a support group you just kind of work your way to therapy that, that's a good place to start. That's all really good information. Yeah. And federally qualified health centers offer free counseling and so in Fort Bend it's Access Health um, and they offer free mental health services. And then like um, Ashton was saying, Remind is the organization that does, they're formerly Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, and so they do free groups all over um, the greater Houston area, including this area. Um, and so they are free for people who are suffering from depression and bipolar disorder, or for family members or loved ones of people who are suffering. And so those are always free, generally open groups um, that you can join. Remind. Remind. Yeah, and non -remind. I, I want to speak for my practice. Um, I do not take insurance. I'm an out-of-network provider for all insurance companies, and I don't take insurance because it is a nightmare for a provider to try to work with an insurance company. But like Ashley was saying, I take sliding scale all day long. Like, I, I, I don't ever want cost to be a barrier to somebody. So people will ask me my fee, I will tell them my fee, and then I will say, if this is a barrier, let me know and we can we can work something out. And what I have found is people who can pay my fee will pay my fee. And people who can't will be honest and we, we figure it out. It's just, it's important to ask, I guess is where I'm going, like Ashley said. 
if you, if you hear a number and you're like, I can't do that, see if, see if they will do a sliding scale. And that's, I know that not taking insurance creates a barrier for some people, and so the way that I try to compensate for that is to, to do a sliding scale. Do you see any change in the insurance companies? Or I mean, we talk so much about that this is an issue in our country, yet our insurance, you know, they, they don't, I have nothing to do with insurance companies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, have, I know that that's... But I will tell you, I inform, and I have clients who use their out-of-network benefits. The other thing is flex spending accounts. I have lots of clients who pay with their flex spending account. But I provide insurance information, and they can they can submit it to their insurance for out-of-network benefits. Some people have great out-of-network benefits. Some people have horrible. And I, if they want to do that, I always encourage them to, to find out what the fee is going to be ahead of time. But I, I, I can't speak to that. Actually, none of them may be able to speak to the insurance situation. Yeah, I think a lot of the issue is with reimbursement rates. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not, for a therapist, it may not be beneficial or worth the time and effort because their reimbursement rate is so low. And the time it takes and to get the reimbursement exactly. rate. Exactly. Yeah. The time that yeah. it takes to get the very small amount of money, I'd rather right. see somebody for free. Right, right. Well, and I think to all of that, most therapists um, will let you do a phone screening or a phone call beforehand, so you can always request that if you want to ask questions about, um, you know, cost up front or hours up front or faith integration up front or something mm -hmm. like that. You can always do a phone screening. You don't even have to do a full session with somebody um, to get to know them a little bit over the phone. You can also do telehealth. That's, I've started doing that um, I actually have a referral on Thursday that I met with via FaceTime that's in Odessa. I've, I've never met the people that they referred from a client that I know. So it, we did a screening. And FaceTime, you cannot guarantee confidentiality. There are other portals that you can, which I'm actually going to be moving over to. But that is, that's another way to do a screening. So you can actually see the person and see if, it, if, if it's a fit. Yeah. That's nice. You can go on a speed date, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at my clock. I can't believe it. But, but we did. Does anybody have a closing thought? I'm sorry. Well, I just think one thing we haven't addressed here is where people are dealing with mental health issues that other people are having that they are interacting with. It may be a family member or somebody that they come into. Uh, uh, they, they are traumatized by mm -hmm. somebody else's mental health issues. Mm -hmm. That. So I, I suppose we haven't really addressed that, and I don't know if there's any comments, last comments about that. Well, I think it all goes to wellness and realizing caregivers, and I mean that, boy, it, um, it's, yeah. Yeah. we are our, who our yeah. relationships yeah. are, right, yeah. the people we come in contact with. So any, any closing thoughts? I mean, it's yeah. all about taking yeah. care of boundaries was the word for all of us. Yeah. Um, but realizing what your limits are, and then realizing where a professional needs to take over either for that person or for you to help better equip you to stay healthy and strong. Um, and so I think we all want to say yes to everything, but I think drawing boundaries is really the healthiest thing we can do for ourselves. And asking yourself, what, what do I have power and control over? Like when we were talking about the eating disorder, how, how much power and control do you have over somebody making changes? And if you recognize, okay, I can't make them go to see a therapist, I can't make them eat, I can't I can't keep them from hurting themselves, then setting your boundaries, knowing your limits, setting your boundaries, and, and letting God handle it. Because we, we do not have power and control over other people. We just have that over ourselves. And not feeling guilty, you know, that like, maybe I could have done this, or, or like, I, I'm not doing enough. No, you, you can never do enough, because that person has to want to, to get the help themselves. And until they get to that point, you know, it's, it's all you can do is support and take care of yourself. We've got another hand. Oh, yes. I this is for Stacey. In the beginning, you talked about, um, you know, our morning time if we're reading scripture and praying and that there needed to be a quiet time. How do you get your mind to get stick on that? So that's not the focus of a quiet time. Because we can't make our minds be still. So what, but what you're the, supposed to listen to God. I know. But, so, and that's why, and I'm a fan of um, mantra meditation or contemplative prayer, and that's where you, the contemplative prayer, and there's an app for contemplative prayer, for it, believe it or not. You can, it has a timer, it has, and I can share that with anybody, but you select basically a word or a verse not first, but you would only want like two or three words, and you repeat it over and over again. And when you find your mind 
wandering, you bring it back to whatever phrase is. whatever the phrase is. I I took Latin in high school, and so I chose um, Latin isn't spoken very well, but Christ, Christus caritas est means Christ is love, and that's what I repeat. Mm -hmm. So you, you want it to be simple, um, but it's you can't. Well, still it. It's just still, bringing it back. I thought it was to have nothing in the mind. No, you can't make it nice. <laughs> but when, so when, when I did, like, one second. <laughs> and then, when, you're doing, when you're doing this, you have to be gentle and kind with yourself because your mind's going to go in 25,000 different directions. Yes. But it's a practice, and when you do it on a regular basis, you will find that it'll t you'll go longer periods before your mind starts wandering. But then you'll be like, oh, in the grocery list, oh, wait, no, Chris Deuce Carter does That's totally fine. Because what also happens is things will come up and like a thought or a realization, and you're like, where did that come from? I think God just gave me, I think God just told me something. And that, the times that I have felt like God is really communicating with me has been during my meditation quiet time. What is the name of that app? Is it something prayer? I think it's a prayer. Okay. I, don't know I think it's Century. Century prayer. Yes. Yes, you're right. Just Century prayer. Yes, you know. That's right. Just Century prayer. Century prayer. Yes, it is. It's Century prayer. Thank you. It's a it's an um, app. It's an app. Oh, it's a website. With centering it. prayer. That is exactly right. Headspace is also a good mindfulness. Oh, I'm reading a book on mindfulness, but it has not been helpful. Mind still. You let go of that expectation. We can't. We just can't sit on this. Can I just ask one other question? Certainly. About. Um, if you've got, if you've always had, and may not, may not have even been aware that you've got negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, if you're not aware, then, like, how do you, like, make that change? Because you may think that everything, that you're being positive, but these negative thoughts are, are, are creeping in. Um, you know, I used to... Occasionally, I'll write do a, a gratitude journal, mm -hmm. and, and that's helpful. Mm -hmm. So I need concrete things to uh, help me to get back into like a positive mode. Well, you are aware of it because you're bringing it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, talk about ourselves. Yeah. Someone else. <laughs> right. about it's, yeah. it's catching yeah. those things, and a lot of times, what I tell my clients is, let's not even worry about changing them. Let's just worry about noticing them mm -hmm. to start off with. Yeah. Because you, awareness is our power. That is our power. We cannot make anything different until we're aware of it. But once you notice it, then you can say, wait, what? Why am I thinking this? What is this true? I also tell, and you all can do this too, I tell my clients, imagine you're in a courtroom. Can you defend this negative thought to a judge? Do you have evidence to back this up? And usually the answer is no. <laughs> and just to teach you a little concrete skill, so we can all make triangles with our fingers. Um, so your thoughts lead to your feelings, which lead to your behavior. So if you're noticing, I don't like this feeling, then you can trace it to, okay, what is this feeling, what behaviors are, are the outcome of this feeling, and then what thoughts do those behaviors create? And you can kind of trace yourself and say, okay, when I was thinking I'm going to be late, then I started feeling anxious, and then I started honking my horn more, which then made me think, people are um, in my way, which then made me feel angry. So then you can stop and say, okay, the original thought of I'm going to be late wasn't really helpful to me. I didn't like the outcome for my feelings and my behaviors. So instead, I'm going to think, I'll get there when I get there. And then my feelings are, okay. And then my behaviors are turning on the radio. And so you can kind of trace for yourself. And so I honestly stop and make a triangle with my hands. I always teach my kids, this is a tool that you have at school all the time fingers. Um, so you can trace for yourself, even if you're not aware of what the thought is at the root of it, you can start with the feeling or the behavior and say, I don't like that I'm yelling at my kids today. I wonder what thoughts and feelings are behind that and kind of trace it for yourself. The other side effect of that is that if you think you're going to be late, you feel guilty. Mm -hmm. All that stuff, you feel guilty immediately if you're mad. Right. So guilt is such a big thing mm -hmm. to try to get rid of. And like Emma was saying, how helpful is guilt? I mean, we should feel guilty when we have intentionally done something to hurt another person. Mm -hmm. 
Outside of that? Yeah, it shouldn't be our reflex. Yeah. Right? We do not that was a reflex. Text message. Yeah. What? Why right. are we feeling yeah. that? Yeah. The thoughts behind it are because driving Because we think we should have done I just kind of wanted to say something about what happened to me personally. I lost my mom suddenly in 2008. We were like really close and I had, I was married, I was married, I'm divorced now, but I was married, I had two kids in middle school, high school, and very busy. And I dealt with it and believe it or not, 2008, I I didn't realize until 2014 that I had not dealt with it. I just kind of like that. I had not dealt with it until something happened that triggered it, and I just, I was just inconsolable for weeks. I, I was crying to drop my hat. And so I had buried it so deeply. And believe it or not, I was reading a novel where someone died. Mm -hmm. And I, I figured out that I had been depressed. And that, well, I was, I had, I never seek help. I prayed about it, but I kind of like just went through the motions for like four or five years until you know, and it's kind, it was like a crescendo. And it took me, you know, a while to really realize that I had just been skating through life because you're always busy. You have, always have so, so much to do, and I was not in touch with my inner feelings, and that can cause you to have like a lot of physical illness. It's like so, so many things that can happen. So sometimes you have to really be in tune to yourself. And I thought I was. And I thought I had dealt with it. I thought I had grieved. But I had really suppressed it. And I find that uh, with a lot of people that I deal with, when they have a, a loss of a loved one or a parent or a spouse, they kind of, they're expected to like, you have a certain period of time to grieve. And then you have to go on with life. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it was very, you know, it was very, very telling. And I learned a lot about myself. But I didn't realize until I woke up one day and I was like, I've not really been myself for the last, you know, four or five years. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a wonderful way to end this because I think this has been such a great conversation and I appreciate everybody's openness. I hope you all learned something. I know I did. I think we've written down some resources here that can be very helpful, um, but I, I'm going to let you out of class. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you so much.